Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining uh, another of the nine Bedford Row International Criminal Law webinars. Um, as I always introduce each webinar of, of the month, um, we decided to go down this route because of the pandemic and our inability to hold our usual international conference. And so we lit upon the idea of the webinar and uh, we found that it's been a successful way of keeping in touch with everybody, as well as uh, discussing subjects of, of interest. And tonight's subject of complicity in international uh, criminal law was something that was suggested to me as being a, a worthwhile uh, subject to examine. And I'm very pleased to announce that I've got Marina Axanova with me. Um, she is the pro assistant professor at the IE Law School. That's the Law School for Innovative Education, which is a very interesting project and um, of, of great significance for international lawyers because it's a, a university that trains students in comparative law. So all subjects are dealt with as international comparative law subjects, rather than students studying their own national laws, which they may go on to do, um, or they may have done already. Uh, but it is a, 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 an institution devoted to teaching uh, the different systems uh, that there are, how you approach those laws. And of course, for international criminal law, that's very important as international criminal law is a construct of, of different nations uh, and a construct of different ideas and philosophies um, that has tried to harmonize uh, what international criminal law should be. Well, um, I'm very pleased to have Marina because she has written a uh, leading book. She's the author of Complicity in International Criminal Law, which is a very thorough examination of the law at that time and um, a, a very important um, authority to consider when looking at cases uh, involving complicity. So having introduced you, Marina, um, we're pleased to have you here. And the first subject I'd like to look at is, is that of the origins of complicity in international criminal law. H how did it come about that complicity became a focus of the lawmakers? Thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting me. It's a pleasure to be here and pleasure to talk about this topic, which informed several years of my research in a beautiful university in Florence. So always brings good memories as well. Um, complicity is a very interesting concept. And before I speak about the origins, I just wanted to bring some terminological clarity to our discussion. What do we mean by complicity so that we are all on the same page? Because it can mean different things depending on the context. So how I understand complicity, it is modes of liability which do not involve perpetration, direct perpetration. So whenever someone does not physically perpetrate the crime, I speak about complicity. And then there are qualifications in the case law which we can talk about in more detail. But in general, and this is also the case in most domestic jurisdictions, we divide um, crime participants into two groups, those who perpetrate and those who assist or instigate in one way or another. So the second group is complicity. And that can uh, include aiding and abetting, instigating. In some jurisdictions, it can be planning, all different ways of contributing when you do not physically perpetrate the crime. So this is an umbrella term. So it's not just aiding and abetting, but also other forms. Yeah. Just that. Yeah. Now for international criminal law, 
we, we can understand why we need this uh, different form of charge because we're not only concerned with perpetrators, as we know, um, militias, army structures uh, devoted to um, uh, particular ends have a leadership, have a control mechanisms. Um, and for that reason, we have always needed this kind of indirect participation um, as being a form of liability, it not just being the perpetrator uh, on the ground. Absolutely. That was a practical issue. And this is also, this goes to your first question about the origins of complicity. So at, at the dawn of international criminal law, how we know it, uh, when the questions of uh, responsibility after the Second World War were decided, there was a practical problem. How do we deal uh, with uh, collective criminality when big portions of the populations are involved, when armies are involved and so on and so forth. So different solutions have been offered um, at that time, uh, including conspiracy and complicity. And complicity was uh, closer to continental lawyers and conspiracy was a solution offered by, by the US delegation and uh, at Nuremberg and also was included in the Nuremberg charter. Uh, so we have both uh, instruments included in the Nuremberg charter, but we have conspiracy taken precedence because at that point in time, uh, it was understood that it would be easier to deal with mass atrocities using the concept of conspiracy. So the way the Nuremberg Charter is formulated, it talks more about this uh, general uh, umbrella concept of conspiracy. So different um, elements and different crimes are covered by the general agreement to commit crimes. And this way, the prosecution at Nuremberg and also at Tokyo also secured themselves in case they don't have enough evidence for specific war crimes or crimes against humanity, they can always return to criminal agreement or conspiracy. And then how complicity emerged in this uh, pattern is that the French charge at Nuremberg and also the one uh, at Tokyo, they both raised questions of fairness. They said, well, perhaps we should not use conspiracy as a big umbrella term. For instance, Judge Donatio de Weber at Nuremberg criticized heavily um, this concept of conspiracy. And he said, well, complicity in continental law systems is perhaps a more fair way um, to hold perpetrators accountable because it provides for a direct link to the specific crime, whereas conspiracy is criminalizing the agreement itself. Um, and as we know at Nuremberg, uh, the general grand conspiracy charge based on Mein Kampf was not successful, whereas yeah. uh, at Tokyo it was successful. So it was a uh, grand conspiracy charge was successful. Yes, it, it's always fascinated me that there was a divergent uh, approach between the two tribunals, Tokyo and Nuremberg, in, in that regard. Did, did that reflect the composition of those courts or was it evidential? What, 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 why, why did that divergence happen? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, primarily, my understanding is that um, there was more um, there was more scrutiny when it comes to evidence at Nuremberg, whereas Tokyo was a little bit uh, a post-pactum affair, and there was more pressure to, to, to get it done. Also, I, I truly think it's a matter of composition and luck and the way the evidence was looked at. And also um, another reason is that modes of liability as such were not at the center stage in general. So it was not um, very important for the both tribunals at that time to establish exactly the connection between uh, the defendants and the crime, they were both fact-based. So both the Nuremberg and the Tokyo judgment are very much fact-based, but uh, at Nuremberg, the idea that Mein Kampf, the book by Hitler, can be used as a proof of 15 years of uh, criminal conspiracy was just not considered 
uh, sufficient, whereas uh, in, in Tokyo it was uh, considered enough to have some, some kind of evidence of a long-term criminal agreement. But I would not be able to say in more depth as to why there was divergence yes. at that point. Um, the, the conspiracy uh, type case uh, is, is always centered on the plan called the agreement, but really the plan and the collection of individuals and uh, groups that they represent uh, forming the policy. Um, and um, that has always been a neat way if in the uh, uh, Anglo-American uh, 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 type uh, common law jurisdictions of dealing with, with leadership. Um, is is uh, what we have though with complicity something more connected with the acts that take place rather than the agreement? Is, is, is that, is that, was that the concern of the, the French judges? Yes, so that was mostly uh, the concern of French judges. The idea was that based on the plan, you could be held accountable, whereas the French judges said it's not enough. We actually need connection to specific crimes. That, that's fascinating, Marina, because I think we have to remember as well that Nuremberg and Tokyo were hastily planned. Uh, <laughs> There, 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 there was little for them to draw upon, whereas now we have a, a body of work post-1945 um, that we can draw upon in a way, and we've had much more discussion, whereas those were courts, let's face it, that were established by the victorious powers with a perspective from their side uh, uh, alone. Yes, yes, there was a unique uh, situation and uh, an interesting beginning for international criminal law because obviously also in terms of sources of law, we are in a completely different place right now because we have Nuremberg and Tokyo, uh, Control Council law jurisprudence and of course modern jurisprudence uh, to draw upon, whereas at the point of creation there was just... Uh, the need to prosecute perpetrators of mass atrocities and consensus, which I write a lot about also in other pieces that there was consensus. It was a moment of understanding that we need to do something about perpetrators of mass atrocities and to move forward. But the way it was done was a complete, in a completely different context as compared to now. Let, let, let's move forward then to the next significant signpost, which is the case of Tardich, obviously. Now, Tardich himself, as we know, was a small-time cafe owner in Kozaratz and a perpetrator uh, within the grand design and, and scheme of things. Um, what, what then happened when we wind forward in time and we come to that moment when the ad hoc tribunal for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, uh, that they're established, and the uh, lawmakers and decision makers are, are looking at the issue again. Had anything changed from Nuremberg, Tokyo? That allows me to make a beautiful transition because how I see it, it's not an abrupt transition from Nuremberg, Tokyo to Tadic, that there have been developments in between. So I would say there have been three avenues for development of international criminal law and particularly complicity. So Nuremberg and Tokyo, very fact-based, very conspiracy-based. Then we see more of complicity in control council law jurisprudence, so in trials by victorious powers in different parts of Germany, French cases, English cases, American cases use the concept of complicity. And very importantly for Tadic, the work of the International Law Commission, which was charged with codifying the Nuremberg principles and preparing a draft code of crimes. Uh, uh, I always forget the, the right name, but mm, crimes against mankind, yeah. uh, something like that. So they were charged with that and it was their mandate. And then the Tadic case, uh, in trying to understand modes of participation, 
relied on actually all three elements. They relied on the Nuremberg uh, judgment, but also uh, they cited a lot of control council uh, law number 10 cases. And then they referred very, very directly to, to this draft code of crimes against humanity, uh, mankind. And in this draft code, we see for the first time specification of modes of liability. So that is this first codified document where uh, we see what aiding and abetting is. It's included as a mode of participation because the Nuremberg, the, the, the Nuremberg Charter did not have a special article on modes of participation. So yes, this is more of a continuum as I see. Yeah, and, and obviously the issues had to be looked at afresh um, at the Yugoslavia tribunal particularly and uh, they had to consider the various modes of participation that may, may take fly, place um, in these uh, uh, large cases involving, often as they did, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and, and even genocide. And so we, we, we see complicity emerging as a, 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 a a more definite concept than conspiracy. Am, am I right in that? Absolutely, yes. At this point in time, uh, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and in particular the Tajic Chamber, was prepared to go into depth into different modes of liability, so focusing more on the link connecting uh, the accused with a crime. And that can be explained by the evolving nature of international criminal law and that we already had the draft code of crimes against mankind, which had an article on modes of liability, but also the fact that it is a lower level perpetrator. And in fact, the conspiracy charge may not have even been that relevant at that point in time for this particular case. That brings again the question of luck and just circumstances to, to the table, which is very common for the International Criminal Court and the ICC, uh, the, the ICTY and so on. But where, where does complicity fit in international customary law, would you say, which, which of course is behind uh, all of this? Are you able to help us with that, explain where it fitted in in those terms? Yeah, this is an interesting question relating to the sources of international criminal law, which is hotly debated by scholars since the beginning of international criminal law. What are the primary sources? And custom has been used a lot uh, in the jurisprudence of the ad hoc tribunals, a bit less by the ICC. But I would say that customary international is not that reliable because we can we can find evidence of different approaches um, when we speak about modes of liability in particular. And why is that? Because modes of liability come from domestic criminal law. So the evidence of custom also comes from domestic criminal law. It's not the same custom that we talk about when we talk about state responsibility or issues related to treaty law and interstate relations. So when we speak about uh, custom in, in international criminal law, for instance, for the joint criminal enterprise, the cases that were used to support the first instances of the joint criminal enterprise have been derived from Italian criminal law and so on. So I would say uh, custom is a, a source that comes both from domestic law and also from Nuremberg jurisprudence, post-World War II jurisprudence, that would also be evidence of custom. So when we look at the Tajic judgment and also the Erdemovich judgment, the first judgments uh, that came in the 90s, we see um, a lot of references to the Control Council uh, law number 10 jurisprudence. And there you can actually see instances of complicity. So especially in the French zone, there have been trials, for example, Becker, which was expressly a complicity case. And then of course, um, the English cases, so some of them use complicity. So I would say that would be the first customary law evidences of complicity. And then uh, we have, of course, uh, references to domestic criminal law as well. It's the same issue of collective criminality that was present at Nuremberg, 
than uh, in the jurisprudence of the ad hoc tribunals and now faced by the ICC. How do we deal with uh, collective criminality? What is the most fitting mode of liability to address collective criminality and in particular leadership crime, but not only. So crime committed in groups, which makes this kind of criminality different from domestic law um, type criminality. So the solution of offered by the ad hoc tribunals was the joint criminal enterprise, which was uh, considered as a form of per perpetration. So it was an extended form of commission Mm, as we know, this was an extension of perpetration interpreted by the ad hoc tribunal uh, tribunals. And then at the ICC, a similar concept is indirect co-perpetration or direct co-perpetration, where it's also an extended form of commission or a little bit altered form of commission. And what is similar between them is that both of them are forms of commission and they're considered to be implicitly more blameworthy by uh, the courts. So the, partially the reason both concepts were invented and um, used was to stress the culpability aspect of mass criminality. The idea, the underlying idea is that if we use complicity, namely aiding, abetting, instigating, it does not reflect sufficiently the gravity of the conduct of the perpetrator or an accomplice. It's just not sufficiently um, highlighting the culpability element. So the hierarchy of participation mode, in my view, was present both um, in the jurisprudence of the ad hoc tribunals and at the ICC. Perhaps that's a reductionist uh, approach. I can see Judge Meron raising his hand. Um, mentioned complicity. Yeah in the context of mass criminality. So my first question to you would be, complicity, must it be related to mass, mass criminality? I presume no. You can have also cases of complicity involving some individuals, individual perpetrators without an obvious link with mass criminality. But what I would really benefit from, if you would try by looking at practice or looking at elements of crimes, uh, distinguish complicity from the several related or concepts. Stephen already mentioned one that was um, joint criminal enterprise. But I would be particularly interested in knowing how do you distinguish complicity from aiding and abetting, which was the crime which was much more often resorted to in international practice? And in that context, if you could tell us, uh, in, in, the, in the ad hoc tribunals, complicity has not been a major um, concept. How is it in the ICC? Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you for your question, Judge Meron, for both questions, because they help to clarify the issue. So complicity must not be related to mass criminality. So that's very good to make it clear. In fact, complicity, uh, it's a concept more suitable for connecting perpetrator to an individual crime. So this is one of the strong points of complicity. It does not require group committing crime. So if we talk about the group committing crimes, that, that other forms of participation may be more suitable. So this is definitely one uh, important point. Uh, complicity versus aiding and abetting, as I said in the beginning, the way I define complicity is it's an umbrella term. It's, uh, it includes aiding and abetting, instigating, and also at the ICC, it includes contributing to a group, which is 25.3D. So for instance, if I use now the example of the Rome Statute, we have 25.3A, which is commission jointly or indirect uh, perpetration. So it's all forms of commission. Then we have B, 25.3B, which is ordering and different forms of ordering, soliciting, inducing the same umbrella. Then we have 25.3c, which is aiding and abetting. And then we have 25.3d, which is contributing to a group. So I would say 
25.3b to d are all forms of complicity. And I apologize now for technicality, but I think it's important to, to distinguish. And 25.3a is perpetration, so it's not complicity. And um, in, in the jurisprudence of the ad hoc tribunal, the first commission would be commission and JC, and then all the other forms of participation mentioned there, planning, aiding and abetting, instigating would be forms of complicity. Uh, my understanding that uh, the International Criminal Court is not using complicity a lot. In fact, they stick very much with uh, 25.3a and referring a lot to indirect co-perpetration that is in some way similar to the joint criminal enterprise. And the rationale there is very much about blameworthiness. So the idea is that uh, we just try to use the concept of commission because it reflects in a most efficient way uh, the, the blameworthiness of the perpetrator. So even if there is no direct commission, they're saying a person uh, exudes certain control over crime and therefore commits a crime by being in control. And this is a German theory. So in that sense, I meant that the indirect co-perpetration and the joint criminal enterprise are similar in the sense that they're both forms of commission. Uh, I do think that complicity in, as in 25.3d, the last point uh, in the Rome statute could be sometimes more suitable to reflect what is actually happening on the ground. And I do think that a little bit of flexibility could be useful because it's not necessary that commission reflects higher degree of blameworthiness. So my position would be that it really depends on the circumstances of the case. And as we saw with Charles Taylor um, and the special court for Sierra Leone, he was um, convicted of complicity, aiding and abetting crimes and he was sentenced to 50 years of imprisonment. And in my view, this approach was quite, um, quite good because we know exactly that he contributed, he helped the army. He was not the direct perpetrator. So we know he was uh, helping and we also know he was quite blameworthy. He received 50 years of imprisonment as a sentence. So that for me would be the approach that I think is useful. Um, turning to Charles Taylor as you um... Uh, mentioned, we have a divergence between Charles Taylor and Perisic, and I think we need to look at look at that now, because in relation to the Perisic case at the ICTY, we had what's called the specific direction uh, requirement, that the accused's assistance was specifically directed at supporting the particular criminal activities, and not just part of a general uh, war effort. Um, it would be interesting for us to know why this divergence between two international tribunals. Um, just to repeat the question that I understood it correctly, you would say that there is divergence between the special court for Sierra Leone and the ad hoc tribunal, but in which way do you see the divergence? Well, the specific direction requirement. Ah, yes, yes. Of yes. Perisic, um, which was something that that they didn't that they didn't accept at, at the uh, 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 tribunal, the STL, Sierra yes. Leone. Yeah. Yes. So, can you help us with why? Why did we get this divergence in, in international criminal law? Yes, this is a very interesting question because ultimately the Yugoslavia tribunal uh, sided with a special court for Sierra Leone approach later by overturning the specific direction requirement. So I view it as a, as a temporary occurrence that happened around Perisic, the, the Perisic case uh, at the ICTY. So around that time and in that particular case uh, with General Perisic, there was a specific issue that needed to be looked at. And this was the way for the Yugoslavia tribunal to look at this issue. And the issue is when uh, the defendant is uh, 
far away from the scene of the crime, both in terms of space and in terms of time. So how, how do we approach complicity and aiding and abetting when there is a um, huge distance between their actions, both in terms of time and space? And in the Parishage case, how I see it, the, the appeals chamber took a very cautious approach saying, yes, he was a general in the army of Respublika Srpska. And it is clear that some of the aid he provided um, was uh, directed to the criminality, but it's really not clear whether he specifically directed this aid to crimes or to war efforts. So in his particular case, how I see it, uh, the issue of uh, proximity and lack thereof was the main problem. And the chamber decided to be very conservative there. But later, um, after the Taylor case, where the approach is more uh, common, so there was no additional requirement that the aid has to be directed towards specific crimes. The, the general requirement for aiding and abetting is that there needs to be awareness that crimes are committed, there needs to be conscious choice to contribute, and then there, the assistance has to have some effect on the crime. So this is a general standard. It has been applied in Taylor and it has been later applied by the Yugoslavia tribunal that overruled another case which used the specific direction for acquittal, which is uh, Stanisic and Simatovic. So the trial chamber in Stanisic Simatovic said they should be acquitted, uh, the defendants, because of the lack of specific direction. And then the appeals chamber overturned this decision and uh, said, no, we are not going to have specific direction as part of the test. So I think, and I see it, um, the Parishage case is more as a one-off case where the issue of proximity arose very clearly and that was a trial um, and it didn't succeed. But we're still going to see the jurisprudence of the ICC, how this issue is going to be resolved. Because in my view, we have not yet had a case at the ICC where uh, this issue has been clearly dealt with. So we may see it in, uh, in the context of responsibility of corporate officials. That can be something very similar when the aid is of mixed nature. Because most corporations do not really want <laughs> to contribute to crimes. They mostly just do their business as usual. But knowing that some of their uh, activities may result in criminality. So this is actually another good example of this mixed type of contribution. So I think we're going to come back to this issue later. I may be wrong. Did it um, uh, different as to what was taking place? Did the courts come up the issue from a different direction. One was a, a war between the former republics of uh, Yugoslavia who were in conflict over a number of different uh, factors, whereas uh, assets and resources in a neighboring state. So had as its objective unlawful activity. Whether the factual circumstances really drove uh, the chambers uh, to different conclusions in both cases, in Taylor versus Perisic, I would have to think about it because how I saw it was mo it was mostly an argument um, about the legal test. So, what kind of legal test we use? Do, do we use specific direction or do we not use the specific direction? Because from where uh, I see it, but of course I need to revisit the specific factual circumstances, the, the situations were quite similar. So there, were, there was provision of aid to military and uh, both financial, because from what I remember, Perisic also provided some financial assistance. I may be wrong. So there was financial and also military equipment type or training type assistance provided by both of the accused. So my understanding was it was more about the standard is do we hold them responsible for complicity or not in case of this uh, mixed type assistance. But uh, it's a good point. Perhaps it's worth revisiting also the differences in factual uh, scenarios there. Yeah, because sometimes that 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 does reflect in the outcome one one finds in a 
in a decision, particularly in a developing area of law. Um, I was interested to hear you um, discuss their corporate uh, criminal liability, and that's something you've written upon re recently, uh, Marina. Obviously, at the ICC and at the ad hoc tribunals, uh, we're dealing with the responsibility of individuals rather than corporations being, being liable. Yes, this is an interesting new uh, avenue for development of international criminal law. And perhaps it's a challenge for the ICC in the future because the ICC receives communications from interested parties, including NGOs and uh, other uh, activist groups. So the ICC receives communications also uh, pertaining to the activities of corporations in a sense that the uh, interested parties are saying heads of corporations or uh, CFOs, chief financial officers can be held responsible as natural persons or so not as legal persons, but as natural persons for crimes committed uh, on behalf of their corporations as part of corporate activity. And this is where uh, complicity may be useful. So recently I um, advised a little bit uh, a German NGO, uh, European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, which filed such communication to the ICC. Uh, it's now under uh, consideration by the Office of the Prosecutor, so we don't know the outcome yet. But the idea is that several, um, several companies located in Europe, in the UK, in Germany, um, in France, in Italy, and in Spain. These corporations contributed to crimes committed in Yemen by virtue of complicity. They did so by supplying weapons to Saudi Arabia, knowing that these weapons will be used um, in aerial uh, campaigns to bomb civilians in Yemen. So then uh, the concept of complicity comes uh, up and is used in the communication to attribute responsibility to corporate officials in Europe, because what they did, uh, they supplied aid to Saudi Arabia. So then this is, this is why the concept of complicity is useful there. So we cannot say that there have been direct perpetration or commission. We cannot speak about even indirect um, perpetration because there is no control over crime, obviously. It's just businesses doing their usual activities, knowing that some of their uh, weapons will be used uh, in criminality. And then do we have sufficient links to the crimes on the ground is something for the prosecution to, to see and to establish. So I will just speak about the, the question. So the question relates to um, journalists propagating for violence and war in another country. So can we apply Article 25, uh, 3 of the Rome Statute to journalists who incite violence, but they do so in a different country? So can we use these tools for, for this kind of situations, factual situations? This is a very interesting question about propaganda and war. So I would say that can also be a case of complicity. It's possible to say that uh, a journalist who is knowingly uh, inciting hatred and violence in a neighboring country is contributing to crimes committed in this country. What is important there is again to establish the test for complicity, like with all other instances. Are they doing it knowingly in a sense are they aware of the crimes committed in the neighboring country? Do they mean to incite violence? And also, uh, is their uh, propaganda having some effect on the crimes committed in the neighboring country? So the actus reus for complicity, namely conduct having an effect, and then the mens rea, namely uh, intent to contribute and awareness of the crimes, all of these elements need to be met but I don't see why um, 25.3c uh, uh, cannot be uh, applicable to this kind of factual situations. And then I only speak about complicity. I don't speak now about jurisdictional requirements, so nationality or territory, 
territoriality. So the, the Rome Statute, of course, has the jurisdictional limitations that need to be looked at. But in terms of complicity, I would say that could be absolutely a case of complicity in theory, uh, the factual scenario that Anthony described in the chat window. And then I see a second question uh, by Jennifer Strachan. Um, Marina, have you at all examined the issue of governments that sell weapons to another government and the weapons are used in the perpetration of crimes, uh, namely the issue of state responsibility? Or was the Yemen case mostly about corporations and companies? So yeah, the, the Yemen case, uh, the submission to the ICC, the communication to the ICC mostly deals with responsibility of corporate officials. My understanding, and I have not seen the final version of the communication, I only participated in part of the work, my understanding is that uh, it also mentions government officials. So it's both corporate officials in these uh, countries. So these this companies in five European countries, they form a consortium. So people are mentioned in different countries, but also why government officials are mentioned in the communication is because governments give authorizations for weapon supplies. So it's actually a link, it's a connection between corporations and governments because one cannot export weapons without governmental authorization. But my understanding is that communication still places more emphasis on corporations because it would be really difficult now to also go up to governmental officials uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But then again, I have not seen the final version of communication whether uh, what kind of attention is given to both parties. So in terms of international criminal law, governmental officials can absolutely also be um, part of this uh, case. Whether they are or not, I wouldn't know. And then, of course, it raises separate issues of state responsibility. But the area of weapons trade in particular is quite um, sophisticated and complicated. It allows a lot of scrutiny in a state. So a lot of ministries are assessing whether to export weapons. So then that would require a lot of um, revealing a lot of confidential information. So I would not know how this issue can be approached in the context of state responsibility and how much the governments would be able to disclose their internal deliberative processes when it comes to weapons and uh, supply weapons and how these authorizations are granted. Uh, but there is arms trade treaty, which has been ratified by the European countries, which requires certain degree of due diligence. Just it's not clear how, how what is the standard in, in practical terms, the due diligence standard. Yeah, Marina, um, just looking at the issue, though, isn't there a problem with the intention um, to say that the CEO intended that war crimes would be committed? Um, is is a leap too far, isn't it? It is. Yes, this is a big, big problem. So I see three problems with this uh, communication and this approach. One is that we have state authorizations. So the corporate officials will say, well, the states uh, actually uh, granted us authorizations to export these weapons and the states are under obligation of due diligence under the arms trade treaty. So we are in compliance because the states authorized us and the states must do due diligence. The second is exactly the purpose to contribute. Article 25 3C of the Rome statute requires for aiding and abetting that uh, the contribution is done with a purpose of facilitating crimes. And how do we prove purpose to contribute with corporate officials? Because they will yeah. say, our purpose is to, to, to conduct business, to make money. Our purpose is not to contribute to crimes. And uh, I have an answer. I don't know if it's convincing. Could be just me thinking creatively. Uh, I would say that 
making money is a motive. It's not a purpose. So it's a reason why they do it, but it's not necessarily the intention. So I would say um, motive can be used as a proof of purpose. So the, the fact yeah. that they continue the pattern of conduct over years, continue supplying weapons, knowing that crimes are still committed, actually, on the other hand, proves uh, the purpose to contribute. So the motive to get money can be used uh, to support the purpose. But it's a creative approach, and I may be absolutely wrong in, in this statement. This, this is really an important factual question, and uh, it also relates to, to the way conflicts are. And for instance, with respect to Yemen, there has been an embargo uh, on the supply of weapons to Houthis, but not to Saudi Arabia. So the Houthi rebels, which is another fraction fighting and, of course, also committing crimes, like it often happens, both parties commit crimes. But there has been an international consensus, uh, so to speak, not to supply weapons to Houthis, but there has not been such an embargo with respect to Saudi Arabia and supporting Saudi Arabia with its campaign. So in this case, I would see, in this particular case, I would see it justified to file um, complaints to the International Criminal Court to bring back the balance a little bit. And that links to the question in the chat box about the power imbalances and how do international courts deal with power imbalances uh, also when it comes to the conflict. And I would say it's one of the most difficult issues and my senior colleagues perhaps have more experience, uh, practically speaking, with this. But the idea is that uh, in this case, there is already an imbalance because the weapons are supplied to one party, but they are not supplied to another party. So in, that, in this specific situation, it's probably relevant to speak about responsibility of uh, this side of the case. But it's not always uh, the situation. Sometimes um, both parties uh, assist get assistance from other groups and in this case complicity is a very useful tool but its shadow side is that it can go too far so we can then say that there are no limits that we can cast the net too wide and then everyone is somehow affiliated if i buy diamonds which have been extracted in an unethical way then perhaps i'm complicit to, in in the crimes uh, committed so there is also that element for complicity, how do we establish the, uh, the border? Like, how do we say this is, this is where the line is? And I would say the answer would be the effect of the contribution on the crime. So we have to see that the, the contribution has certain degree of effect on the crime and it has to be, either we can describe it as substantial or we can describe it as direct or we can find other terms to describe it, but the contribution needs to have some tangible effect on the crime. So that would be my answer, how to measure, how to draw the line. Um, can, you, here, can you see that on the chat box, Marina? Um, about the policies of constructive engagement that companies go into regions under constructive engagement. Yes, I can see this question and I would love to have more conversation with the uh, author because I, I'm not sure I understand what they mean of what they mean by constructive engagement if the question is about the politics of it and uh, asking the companies to go into countries which already have certain human rights issues and violations which is exactly the situation with Saudi Arabia and Yemen so the companies may say well then we are not even encouraged to go and do business there so if if this is the question with respect to countries that have human rights issues, then it's absolutely a difficult question to resolve. And it's about the consensus being built in international community. To be honest, I think it's a question of consensus, how much we are ready to go after corporations and how much we are ready to impose strict due diligence obligations for corporations in general. Because at Nuremberg, there was some discussion about organizational responsibility. We know that there have been some cases 
post Nuremberg about corporate complicity and companies were held responsible or corporate officials, but then it stopped. So there was no more consensus to go in this direction. What I personally feel right now is that we have a renewed interest in holding corporations accountable also because of Facebook and all this monopolies and all of that, that the consensus is slowly building up to have higher degree of scrutiny. And then the scrutiny will apply both to countries where human rights are not uh, enforced and also to countries, um, so-called democracies uh, or established democracies where there can also be violations of human rights. So it's not uh, endemic for endemic to countries like Sudan or Afghanistan. We can see violations um, perpetrated by corporations also in other countries. So it's more of a general consensus whether it exists or not. And my sense that we're moving towards that point. I may be wrong. Judge, judge yourself and ask it. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. I was very much interested in the comment made by Marina uh, as to the fact that the ICC has not yet uh, really dealt with um, a comprehensive definition of the elements of crime of aiding and abetting. Because what is interesting is that the statute of the ICC, which you mentioned, in Article 23, I believe, Paragraph 3, in defining the crime of aiding and abetting, um, states that this must be done for the purpose of facilitating the crime. And this is really conceptually not very far away from the judgment of the appeals tribunal at the Hague on the Perisic case. And therefore, I think that the issues here are still sort of work in progress, which will very much depend on the interpretation to be given in the future by the ICC. And I'm sure that they will have some cases which uh, will be relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. I completely agree on that point. Um, I will just clarify what I said uh, so that it's more uh, comprehensive. So 25.3 has been used by the ICC. So we have a standard in the Rome Statute and it has been used, for instance, in the case called Bembe et al, Bembe et al and others, where uh, this mode of liability was used. But exactly where we have a point where perishage may come up again is the type of contribution. Is it substantial? Is it neutral? Does it have to have causal link to the crime or not? So it's not clear from BEMBA, and I would say BEMBA and others is the only one which deals with uh, 25.3c comprehensively. The judges there say, well, we are not going to use substantial contribution, but the contribution has to have some effect on the crime, but they don't go as far as to explain neutral contribution, so that of mixed character. And in this Ben Betal case, they, they don't really need to go there because the assistance there is quite clear. It's about the legal team and how they may have contributed to some, uh, some specific crimes. So it's not similar in the factual sense to Perisich where the distance is very far from between the crime and the potential accomplice. So we don't have a clear standard about the effect of the assistance on the crime. And if I may just use a tiny bit of time, just a couple of minutes to say something about causal contribution, because it's used quite a lot when we speak about complicity, that the aid has to have causal contribution to the crime. That always uh, rings untrue for me because I studied causality in a bit of detail. And in fact, it's not necessarily correct to say causal con contribution, because if we talk about causality in natural world, it's I light a match and the house is on fire. But we can't speak about causality when we speak about influencing someone else. Because uh, the criminal law is premised on the idea of autonomy of individual. So I cannot cause um, someone to do something. I can influence them, but they still have their autonomy to act how they want. 
So that I would take out of the definition of the contribution. I would not say that it has to have causal effect on the crime. I would say it has to have some effect on the crime. So I just wanted to say this because I always read about causality and it is always interesting to see in the judgments how we presume that someone can cause someone else to commit a crime. Thank you. Um, this is John Traversi speaking from Nine Bedford Row. Um, <clears throat> I don't think Stephen's going to overcome his difficulties, frankly. And um, uh, in those circumstances, we better call it a day um, if we're all agreeable. Um, thank you very much, Marina, for that absolutely fascinating um, introduction to the topic. We're very grateful to you for providing um, it to us. Uh, I particularly, because I have, um, uh, I have an inquiry into complicity in a certain area ongoing at the moment, and it's been very useful for me uh, and opened my mind to um, all sorts of areas which, uh, which um, I, I hadn't looked at yet. So I'm very grateful to you for that. And I'm sure that uh, that goes um, across the board it's been very good to see you all here um, and onwards and up one upwards to uh, the next one of these encounters. Um, thank you very much again, Marina, for that. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for hosting me. It was a pleasure.